The story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is something familiar with. We heard it in Sunday school years ago. It seems pretty straightforward. Jesus feeds a lot of people. It's impressive that it is the only sign or miracle that is in all four of the Gospels. All four of the Gospels, this is what they agree on. Jesus was cool, son of God, he fed 5,000 people, taught a lot, was crucified, died, buried, resurrected. That's what they all agree on. Right? The feeding the 5,000 is somehow essential to all of them. And yet when you look at each of the different versions, uh, there are nuances. There are details. And it's not that they're disagreeing with uh, each other. They all remember the same event. But each of them remembers different aspects of it. Today we're going to look at how John remembers this, because uh, I think he tells it in a way that's fascinating. He begins by telling us that Jesus goes up a mountain. But it's not actually a mountain. Whenever you read the word mountain in the Gospels, it's never a mountain. It's always the mountain. Because whenever you have a prophet going up the mountain, Moses finds the burning bush or comes down with the Ten Commandments. Elijah goes up the mountain and finds God. Jesus goes up the mountain and is transfigured. Right? When someone goes up the mountain, duck and cover, something's about to happen. So Jesus goes up the mountain, and the people gather because they, they have seen Jesus healing, and they expect something to happen, and he's teaching them. And uh, both John and Mark connect what's about to happen to uh, Moses, but in different ways, actually. Uh, Mark points out that Jesus organizes people by fifties and hundreds, which is how Moses organizes people before leading them to the promised land. John points out that this happens right next to the Passover, which is the celebration of what Moses did. So both of them are making the connection. This is some, a, a prophet going up the mountain, and uh, he, something's about to happen, right? And this is next, think of Moses, for being reminded of Moses. And so after teaching the people gathered, Jesus asks how they're going to feed all these folk. Now, uh, the translation is test, but I think the, the sense of it is uh, stretch their faith. What, what Jesus is doing is he is stretching their faith. He knows what he's about to do. He asks them so he might stretch their faith, push them a bit further. Now, this only shows up in this gospel, what happens next. Uh, the disciple Andrew says, well, we got a boy over here who's got uh, two fish and five loaves. Now, John really focuses in on this boy because he doesn't just say it's a boy. He, he actually uses uh, not just the Greek word for boy, he uses the double diminutive. What that, it's not Robert, it's not Bob, it's little Bobby. Right? That's what the double diminutive, he's using the double diminutive for this boy. How old of a boy can you call little Bobby? before he starts to say, that's not my name, my name's Bob, right? How, how old is that? Anyone make a guess? Teachers here? Right? So think of that, little Bobby. So little Bobby has, uh, Andrew, uh, the disciple Andrew says he has some fish. And again, it's, he uses the double diminutive. It's not just he has fish, fresh caught, fresh fish. No, it's the double diminutive. It's fish. It's a small fish. It's a dried up old fish that's probably more useful for a dog chew toy, more cartilage than meat. He's got these two little itty bitty little fish. Not sure if they're minnows or fish, but they're small. And uh, he's got some bread. He's got some barley bread. Barley bread is that cheap bread. It's horrible. You ever put a piece of bread in your mouth and just sucks the spit all out of your mouth all at once? <laughs> So here's this little Bobby. He's got these two withered up little pieces of fish, and he's got these, these loaves of bread that suck the spit right out of your mouth. I don't know what you're going to do with these, Jesus, but that's what we got. I don't know if the disciple Andrew is being sarcastic or not, but that, he, that's what he points out. And so, uh, Jesus, now th this is the part you have to use your imagination a bit, because it skips what happens next. Because it's not like it's in the context of worship where uh, he takes the plate and offers it to the boy and the boy puts the fish in it, brings it forward, we all sing the doxology. No, this is like a crowd gathered. And so Jesus has to go and, and get down on the boy's level and ask him for his lunch. You ever try to talk a small boy out of his lunch? That, that, that's a hard, hard sell, right? That, that, that's not an easy thing. And so... I'm sure Jesus is very polite and patient, and at some point, the, the lad, little Bobby, gives up the, the food, and, uh, he, and, and Jesus walks away. And, and I just have this, I can just see this moment when little Bobby's looking up at Jesus, who's walking away, thinking, here's my lunch. 
And so uh, Jesus takes the fish, takes the bread, and, and he blesses it. The verb is Eucharistio, from which we get the word Eucharist, communion. Uh, gives, gives thanks. And uh, the, the, the way that was often done in that day, uh, and what prob Jesus probably said is, uh, Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He blesses it, and uh, then he feeds the people feeds the people. And, and when did little Bobby get fed? I, I don't know. Was he first in line? Was he last? But at some point he has this unexpected. He has given it up and then he gets something back. It's an amazing thing. Jesus said at the beginning of this, he asked them, how shall I feed them? Because he wants to stretch their faith. And I think we often assume that he is talking about the disciples. I think there are some other people whose faith was stretched in this moment though as well. I got to think about that boy, right? What happens to that boy? What happens to his understanding? What, what, what happens here? Little Bobby, you know, what happens to him when, when he grows up? Maybe a better question to ask is why does John remember him when no one else does? Right? Although they're Matthew, Mark, Luke, they forget about little Bobby, but uh, John does. What happens when little Bobby grows up and becomes Robert? And what impact does, does having given the fish and the bread away have on his faith down the road? And the decisions he makes? And how he becomes part of the early church? And does he end up as leading in that church? Right? We don't know. We know a lot of the details of the early churches from the letters of Paul, the book of Acts, but uh, we don't know about his church. Another church we don't know about is the, the church in which John writes the gospel. Every, every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all written in a context of a church. They're, so what, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, each of them sit down at some point and say to the rest of the church, you know, we've got to write this stuff down. Okay, what should go in the gospel? What do we need to remember? And, and, and I'm going out on a limb here, but I'm going to suggest that it might just be possible that when John sat down with his church, and he gets to the point of trying to figure out what does he need to say about the feeding of the 5,000. Who might have been there to suggest, don't forget me. I was there. I'm the one who gave the fish and the bread, and I'm still here. I'm still following. You know, for all we know, it, like Jesus goes up on the mountain, and he might have preached the Sermon on the Mount that day. And for all we know, little Bobby has completely like slept through and whiffed on the Sermon on the Mount. But he remembers this, right? It's amazing what we remember. He remembers this. This is what stuck. How he gave a small gift and something happened. Now, is that exactly how, how it all unfolded? I, I don't know. I don't know. We, we really don't know what happens to the boy. But what we are certain of is that John remembers. John remembers that boy. John remembers little Bobby who gave the fish and the bread. And maybe the rest of what I'm spinning is simply imagining. But I am certain that when you give fish and bread to Jesus, your faith is stretched when you watch what he can do with it. Now, I want us to have a little bit of an experiment about maybe stretching our faith today. And for that, I'm going to ask for something as well. I need a dollar. Who here has a dollar bill they'll trust me with? Okay, I'll take your dollar. <laughs> now you trust me with this dollar, right? My dad would say, safety first. This is the moment where little Bobby is giving away his fish and his bread, right? It's gone. He has no clue what's going to happen next. Right? We, we know the answer. We know how the story unfolds. He didn't. What is the point at which his, his faith is stretched? It's right here. Right? A little bit uncomfortable right now? What did Andy just do? Did he seriously just do that? That was lighter fluid. Right? You don't know what's about to happen next. 
But he trusted me. And that's how it works, right? Go buy someone lunch. I need a five. Who's got a five for me? Right? If I need a five, someone got a five for me? You got another five for me? Right? You've risked it once, and you'll do it again, right? Would you start it out with a five? Maybe, maybe not, but you'd start out with a one. That's what we talk about stretching, right? You start out with something, you see how it goes, and then you're willing to risk a little bit more. Now, it's actually a federal fe uh, felony to burn money. So uh, I didn't actually burn the money. But uh, <laughs> it took a while to figure out how to do that. <laughs> um, but that's that moment, right? Where you, you can't believe he's actually about to do that. It's gone. Oh my Lord, where am I going to get lunch? And then something happens, and, and this boy's faith is stretched. And next time when he has to risk something for Jesus, he'll push a bit farther, won't he? We know how that works in our lives as well. Uh, when we take the time to pray and to read Scripture, we give it a little bit of time, what do you get? Get a little bit of guidance. You read a little bit more, you stretch your faith, you give it a little bit more time, and you trust it a bit further, and you start to understand a little bit more about how to see God in the world. We, we give of ourselves to the church. We start, start to, to maybe give a buck every once in a while to the church, and, and we start to believe that uh, there will be enough to go around. And then we stretch a bit further. And then we start to experience that uh, as we give more, we start to plan and be able to do it more consistently. We realize that uh, we can really have peace with our money. There are a lot of people who do not have peace with their money, but we can find that peace. It's got to stretch. We start giving ourselves to the church, uh, to the community, spending some time here, and we find out that there's some good folks here, right? And so you stretch a bit further, and what do you find? Stretch your faith, give a little bit more. You start developing the community. The community starts to grow, and it gets even better. Now, it doesn't always work out cleanly and obviously, and there's that moment when the, the dollar's burning when you don't know what's going to happen next. I, I, talking to Olivia about this, we've had this experience when, uh, when I w we were at Buckland before this, and Olivia was working at South Shelby, and it was in many ways her dream job. It was her dream job. She had a great administration. She had a solid band program. She was teaching the choir, and... Um, good community, good support, and she was making $8,000 more a year than I was. That If you ever wondered, a Truman Masters is worth eight grand more than a Duke Masters a year. Uh, <laughs> and there's this moment where when you give up the fish and you haven't figured out what's going to happen next, there's that moment where you, you got to think, am I really going to do this? There's that moment when uh, we're sent up north to Milan, and all we know about Milan at the time, literally, this, Olivia knew this, I didn't even know this much, was that uh, you might want to learn Spanish. That's it. That's the totality of what we know about Milan. And, and so when Olivia is leaving behind this great job to come up here, how long does it take from the giving the fish to receiving what, what, what's about to happen. I mean, you got it pretty quick. You gave up a buck, gave, got a 20. That was, that was a nice quick turnaround. Wouldn't it be nice if all life was like that? It's not. When you start to stretch your faith and, and, and try to do something new, you get, got to get through that moment. And, and now that we as a family have got through that moment, we wouldn't trade anything for, for living here because what Olivia gave up was being a teacher and now she's a mom with two children in Milan. Right? Wouldn't go back. And, and it, I, I was talking to Doc Richards yesterday, and, and it, talking about this, and he said the same thing for, for him. Uh, eight years ago, you may have heard he ran into some trouble. There's a reason that Blue Cross Blue Shield will not give him insurance, right? And I was telling him about this, and, and he said, you know, I, I, I've had the same experience. I would, he had to do that. He had to go into rehab, and he had what he thought he wanted, and now on the other side of it, he would never go back. He would never go back. He is far happier today than he ever was then. But you've got to go through that moment when the dollar is burning and you're thinking, what's next? Right? I want to invite you to, to spend some time in that moment between the dollar and the 20, between the, the, the giving the, the bread and the fish and the receiving what Jesus offers. I want to invite you to spend some time uh, 
stretching your faith in some new ways. Lead something you've never tried before. Right? We're taught, we're, as a church right now, we're looking at who's going to lead in the coming year. Um, how might you lead and step forward and try something new? How might you give in a way you haven't given before? Maybe money, maybe something else. I don't know. I mean, how might you give in a way that you have never given before, trusting that on the flip side it's going to work out? How might you serve in a way you haven't served before? Because I can tell you, when you start to serve, at first, no matter what you do, if you start serving at first, it's going to be really, really uncomfortable. I promise you it's going to be uncomfortable. I first became a street pastor. I was amazingly uncomfortable. And now I miss it. I really do. Right? If you're going to get stretched, there's got to be that time where you, you've, stepped, you've left behind what was comfortable and you haven't come in to God's blessing for what's next. Stretch your faith. Don't avoid that time. Trust God with it. Trusting that the Lord who accepted two fish and five loaves and used them to feed 5,000 can take whatever we offer and use it to transform our lives as well. Amen.